Thank you very much. My name is uh, John Single. I'm the program director and program manager and program lead for the PPM practice and cloud practice for um, Quantum PM. Um, we're really excited about this um, webinar series we're going to be having. Uh, let me go down to the next slide. Um, what we're going to be doing is over the next um, six months or so, we're going to have a, a monthly webinar um, that talks about, you know, project and portfolio management um, and really some of the opportunities around that. And really it's going to focus on um, best practices for supporting PPM activities. Um, and then it's also going to talk about, you know, and then some of the subsequent sessions will focus on, you know, key components and key ingredients of those particular sessions. So. Today we're going to focus on, you know, where we're going to talk about PPM, the importance of it, um, and how we can use the project management office to enable and support um, those app, those capabilities. Um, and then we're going to have some subsequent discussions. I mean, we're going to focus on episode two, and the, the reason we tag these as episodes is because, um, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, these are sequential and they all kind of integrate to with one another. Uh, episode two will focus on agile and waterfall approaches. Um, we're going to talk, I mean, those are both system development life cycles um, for IT, but we're going to talk about, you know, the agile organization as well, um, continuous shift, continuous development, um, which is permeating not just the IT world, but also organizations um, from, a, from a business, to, from a new capability development, from a practice development, from a product development, from an organizational um, innovation perspective. Um, episode three, we're going to focus on the intake process, um, how we prioritize and ideation. Um, which is a big component that a lot of companies are seeing. I mean, the, the ability to innovate rapidly and, and bring things to market and, and how we support innovation and what an innovation incubation engine would be. Um, <clears throat> number four, we're going to talk about, um, you know, new product development and innovation specifically. I mean, that's going to focus on, you know, new ways of doing it. That's going to be the, the innovation engine. Um, episode five, we're going to talk about resource management and PPM. I mean, one of the things that's really good about a, an excellent PPM tool um, is it gives you the opportunity to predictively um, anticipate what your resource needs will be in the future. If you if you manage your portfolio properly, um, you'll get an idea and, of what the proposed portfolio will look like. Um, and then from there, you can anticipate what resources will look like and, you know, where you're going to have deficiencies both by individual and by skill sets. So we're going to talk about that. And one of the key opportunities there is really, you know, how do we integrate that with um, with HR, for example? How do I hire and, and anticipate um, and make sure that we're bringing on skilled resources as we um, as we need them? Where we've got shortfalls and, and key dependencies, where there's, um, you know, single points of failure that we might need to attend to. So that's what we'll focus on in episode five. And then number six is give you reporting and dashboards. Um, every ecosystem needs reporting and dashboards. And, and one of the challenges, you know, having been doing this for quite a while is that, you know, organizations from a PPM um, project management perspective really have a couple key challenges. It's really around portfolio management, resource management, and reporting. Um, and usually people are building manual reports. Uh, they're they don't have a single source of truth, single source of data for these particular reports. And as a result, accuracy and timeliness can be a challenge. So we'll talk about those in episode six. Um, so I hope everyone joins us. And, um, you know, we're pretty excited about have, having this series. Um, if you want to register, um, here's our website, Quantum PM webinars. So if you go on our website, you can um, sign up for the additional sessions and subsequent sessions. Um, the PMO, the PPM opportunity in the PMO. Um, Really what, it, really what it requires is for most organizations that they really need to have a project management discipline within the organization. Um, and what we're going to focus on is really the stages that, are, that occur here. We're going to talk about building out the PMO, some of the PMO capabilities, some of the key functionalities around portfolio analysis, resource management reporting, and then the importance on continuous improvement um, as we go. Um, I mean, as we get to the whole um, idea of a PMO, uh, we will talk about you know, some of the key cap capabilities and attributes that need to be supported by it. Um, one, one thing is about who Quantum PM is. I mean, just, just so you know who we are as an organization, I mean, we are a, a gold Microsoft partner um, focused on, you know, project portfolio management tools, application development, um, cloud productivity. Um, we're, we're registered with um, PMI. Um, so we, we specialize quite extensively on um, building out um, ecosystem-wide portfolio and project management solutions. And it's not just the, you know, the tools themselves around using the micro, we are a Microsoft partner, we, we use Microsoft technology, but it's really about building a, I guess I would call it a project management ecosystem, both from a capability perspective and also from a data perspective, um, 
you know, to make sure that we can provide the information and, and, and do the analysis that will allow enterprises to make um, timely and informed decisions <clears throat> in terms of where they're investing their assets and um, be able to proactively monitor um, how particular projects are being done. We, one of the tools that we like to talk about is our BI Advantage tool. Um, it's something that we sell that's kind of per, kind of unique to the marketplace. It's really a great an integration hub. Um, but one of the challenges a lot of organizations have is really, you know, getting everything to a single source of truth and a single source of data. Um, and then we, we do spend a lot of time, and we actually develop this tool to facilitate that. So. You know, in many cases, if we're doing like IT service management and we want to integrate that with, with um, Project Online, we can do that. If you want to integrate um, like Archer, if we're doing, um, you know, global risk management, uh, integrate with ERP, um, integrate with PLM applications, um, we can do all those types of things. So really, it allows you to do the reporting and, and, and consolidation of functionality um, across the entire um, enterprise. Let's talk about, you know, why PPM is really important today. Um, everybody talks about, you know, disruption and digital disruption, and it's really hard to overstate, you know, the degree of change we're seeing within the world today. Um, I mean, some of the things that we're, we're talking about is really, you know, fundamental realignment of the relationship between a customer and a provider. And it's impacting not just the customer relationship with the, with the, with the provider, but also how providers um, inter basically inter interact with one another. Um, I, I found this article in McKinsey Quarterly, and this was actually published about a week ago, you know, talking about some of the some of the key challenges that many companies have in terms of understanding digital disruption and really the impact it has on everything and, you know, why do digital strategies fail? You know, in a lot of cases, you know, we talk about this fuzzy definition. They don't really know what it is. And this is kind of an interesting couple data points here is it's nearly instant, free, and flawless ability to connect people, devices, and physical objects anywhere. By 2025, 20 billion devices will be connected, nearly three times the world population. And this is the one I, I really find fascinating. Over the last two years, such devices have churned out 90% of the data ever produced. Um, and then they had this, so, you know, given those three data points, the ability to, what, what does all that data mean? And, you know, one of the challenges I see as a consultant frequently is, you know, I have a lot of data, but not a lot of knowledge. Um, another key pitfall is a whole misunderstanding of the economics of digital. Um, it's, you know, to, as they call it, sorry about that. It's confounding the best laid plans to capture um, surplus we're creating. And really, you know, what this is doing is pushing the winners in the in a provider system to really the winner takes all type environment. You know, actually the economics value rises to the top and the ex a good example there is Amazon. I mean, within retail, for example, you know, if you look at the market cap of Amazon versus some of the other retail firms, I mean, it's, it's definitely heavily skewed. So it's a winner take all type phenomena. Um, overlooking the, um, you know, overlooking ecosystems. And one of the things that's, you know, the industries are thinking themselves really as individual players within a niche. Now, the thing is, when you think about it from an ecosystem perspective, it's really the integration between these different companies and how they can, you know, we used to call them affinity groups of how they can partner and work together, um, you know, and, and provide a, a suite of services and a suite of products. And I think this is, you know, some of the two, some of the cases where, you know, in this exhibit here, you know, the degree of change goes up, the pace of change is getting faster, and depending upon, you know, what industry you're in, the degree of change that's going to have to be undertaken, you know, it really impacts, you know, how, how fast you need to move. For example, in the case of retail and media, you know, the degree of change is high, pace of change is, fit, is high, and the cost of not acting in many cases is fatal. Um, agility, the companies to innovate and rapidly move. I mean, that's also required given the high degree of change. Let's talk about something else. Some of the other, why do these digital strategies fail? You know, over-indexing on the usual suspects. Um, I mean, one of the challenges you have is that, you know, we totally talk about, you know, who are the key innovators, but they're not really thinking in terms of, you know, who are your competitors and what are they doing? And the other thing is the whole B2B piece of this is where, you know, you're thinking about the relationship between the customer, but again, the, when we talked about this whole idea of um, affinities between different companies, we talked about B2B across different organizations. You know, this is a major pitfall that goes on. <clears throat> and then we talked about the duality of digital is another major pitfall. You know, you not only need to innovate for new models, but you got to support your current ones. Um, so a lot of times companies are so focused on new stuff, they, they, they don't understand that they currently need to focus on their old ones as well. And I think this is always a really great little model here is that if you think about, you know, 8% of companies believe their business model will remain viable um, going forward. 
Um, and here's a, here's a good one. Here's the incumbent business model and their market share. Their market share collapses unless you adopt a digital market share in many cases, and those will basically reassume the larger piece. And, and you know, some of these ones that don't actually move quick enough, they wind up, um, you know, basically failing and becoming smaller. And, in fact, since as we talked about, all the all – the, you know, wealth is at the top and the capitalization is at the top, you know, they're not necessarily going to survive. Now, you know, why do we bring all this stuff up? And we talk about, you know, digital transformation and disruption. I mean, I don't know if anybody read the New York Times this morning. I turned, I opened up the paper and Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan team up to disrupt healthcare. You know, and this was something that came out a couple hours ago today. You know, you're talking about, you know, the three of the biggest innovative companies here talking about creating free from profit making incentives and constraints. You know, and they, you go over here to CNBC and they talk about slam suppliers, including Express Scripts, Cigna, CVS, United Health, and Aetna. Um, and this is the kind of disruption you're going to see. And, and why is this important to us? Because, you know, as practitioners within the project and portfolio management place, the ability to manage projects and programs under, and, you know, portfolio management focusing on the doing the right things and making sure we're, re, we're working on the correct work, uh, being able to deliver things in a quick and, and, and expedient manner, making sure we don't have um, failures as far as delivery, it's absolutely critical. I mean, the, the world is changing at such a rate here that we need to make sure uh, that we can deliver things effectively and these, and these skills and capabilities become uh, more and more um, important as we go. Um, I, think the, I think the other thing is, you know, you know, they talk about the agile organization. We, we talk about, like, DevOps and things like that, where there's continuous build from a technology perspective. All that means is that we need to have better controls and be able to act quicker. And that's why, you know, making sure we work on the right things from a PPM perspective, making sure we work on things proper. Uh, we have a, a good insights into what we're working on from a project perspective, having reports and dashboards that support these things. Um, so it's all critically, you know, very much critically important. Um, okay. So... Lori, do we have any questions on anything at that point? Because I was going to get into the how we do this part now. No, I don't see any questions yet. Okay. Okay, so excellence in program and portfolio management, to be honest with you, has never been more important. Um, and here's the definition of what that is, and this is from PMI. Uh, pro, um, Project Management Institute. It's really portfolio management ensures an organization can leverage its product selection and execution success. It refuses to the centralized management of one or more project portfolios to achieve strategic objectives. Our research has shown that portfolio management is a way to bridge the gap between strategy and implementation. Um, the promise of IT portfolio management is the quantification of previously informal IT efforts, enabling measures and objective evaluation of investment scenarios. Okay, so what this is telling us really is, is from an ability to do this, is not just our execution success, but it's really to have, you know, quantitatively and previously informed, really a measure and objectives and evaluate of our investment scenarios. It's really ensuring that we have a consistent, um, measurable way of evaluating what's going on for for, um, for our specific projects. Um, so that we're just not, you know, randomly doing things and, and um, you know, making sure that we're actually working on the right things. I and mean, like I was saying before, I mean, organizationally, one of the challenges I see all the time is, you know, bringing things into the portfolio. You know, it's very subjective. There's, you know, who's got the heavier hitting executive pushing something um, leads to the mis misalignment between supply and demand when there's too much demand coming into the portfolio versus what we can perform. So the ability to quantify and, and really understand these things is, is absolutely um, critical for how we do these things and achieve success. Okay, so what are we trying to do? Um, portfolio management, resource management, and project management is really aligning projects and resources with the strategy. Um, a lot of times what you're seeing here is that, you know, we, we've got this demand for, uh, in many cases, a particular service or capability flowing up from the business. We've got a strategy on the top where these are the organizational objectives and really trying to achieve that harmony and, and shake that says, you know, not only this is what we can work on, but making sure we're working on the right, the right things. Um, and on the right here, which is, you know, pretty, pretty good here, we talk about, you know, real-time executive decision support, um, investment resources and prioritization of decisions and making sure that we understand based on the amount of money we can spend or, the, or our, our cost areas, you know, what decisions should we make. Um, also having a business case that, you know, in many cases we might want to borrow money or partner with something is really understanding the value proposition of particular investment decisions. 
um, integrated portfolios of, of managed projects where we look at the portfolio of projects and, and understand what the trade-offs between these are and ensuring and validating the business cases um, consistent and, and still, val and still um, valid. And then the whole idea of a repeatable project delivery model, uh, making sure that not only can we do these things, but we learn from our lessons um, so that we can, in fact, not only deliver things, but we engage in continuous improvement and push things that pushes through the process and allow us to repeat our overall, um, uh, our overall successes. Okay, let's talk about um, portfolio management. Um, I think it's really a couple things where you've got the, the downward arrows on the left and the upward arrows on the right. Um, from a hierarchy perspective, you know, what, what you're talking about is a portfolio management decision, a program management decision, and then what we call project management. We go from the top level, which is more strategic, to the program, which is managing the portfolio of projects, and then the, pro and the project itself, which is performing and executing um, one individual project um, going forward. Um, so let's talk about the top layer. I mean, really in terms of setting direction, I mean, that's really, and I think this is pretty important, is really the strategic planning of this. Um, understanding from a strategic analysis, um, what is the objectives for the long-term portfolio? You know, what are our revenue and cost metrics that are going into it? Um, you know, basically in terms of generating new investment portfolios and multi-segment proposal generation, to of actually going ahead and prioritizing and selecting the individual pieces of the portfolio. And then we've got a cyclical appro um, initiative approval process. Uh, most organizations, what they do in those cases is, you know, they have quarterly um, portfolio review meetings. Uh, and, the, and, and the thing is to perform that in a timely manner so that um, you're actually looking at not just the portfolio of projects that you are considering as candidates for inclusion into the portfolio, but also looking at those that are currently there to validate their business case. Um, and this is one where, you know, having tools and processes so that this does actually, so that these sessions actually become value-added meetings is, is really important. I mean, I've seen many of these portfolio management meetings where <clears throat> the team prepares for two weeks, generates manual reports, uh, you know, they're wrong, there's data problems with them, um, it's not real time, um, they're spending, you know, just an inordinate amount of time preparing for these things and really, you know, the, instead of actually va validating and, and making sure we're making valid uh, investment decisions, we're in fact, um, you know, in effect pushing paper and, and having and dealing with ineffective processes. So that, the, the top layer is really focused on the whole setting of directions. From an assumptions perspective, the program management piece of this, um, you know, this really gets to the lower level of detail. We've got the, the, the initiation and planning and detail planning where we actually plan the, um, you know, what the project was, projects will look like. You know, let's look at the resources, for example. Let's look at the, the, the cost. Let's talk, and then, then we have the execution and gating, which is dependencies and critical path and issues and risks. Um, focus on system to solution deployment areas, and then we can go through um, closure, which we would go ahead um, and create the program where we actually develop um, transition from development to maintenance. A couple things that, you know, from a best practices perspective to think about here um, is when you're planning the development and the, and the resources is making sure that you look at the entire portfolio of resources um, and optimize that. Um, in terms of execution and gating, making sure that we've got a consistent schedule and consistent gating process from both a quality assurance perspective and also from a reporting perspective. Um, one of the challenges I see a lot is that, you know, that there's inconsistent methodologies being applied. Um, in some cases, rather than there, there could be project delays and rather than accepting and, and addressing those project delays, um, they're actually going ahead and, you know, just shortchanging and cutting out pieces of the methodology. I've even seen ones where they have um, what they call a, a, um, a questionnaire at the beginning and we can just make the, have a, you know, methodology, methodology of the day type thing where there's complete inconsistency. But <clears throat> having those permutations for um, methodology and, and building those, those permutations and having, you know, gating around them and reporting around them and ability to do continuous improvement on them is all pretty much an important best practice around it. Um, deployment, um, really that's a, that's a big part here. And, and I was gonna add something else here is the whole, not just deploy, but also um, transitioning to like production support, making sure we understand how we're gonna support that. Um, but also making sure we have the methodologies and tools in place for doing that. Um, and this can also work with, you know, a, an agile type framework. Um, closure and evaluation, transition from development to maintenance. Uh, really this is, you know, the transition across where we, we actually deploy it, 
move it to a production support update documentation. And then we have change control, which is important along this aisle here for, um, you know, any changes to the, the previous boxes, we're making sure we understand the impact on scope and timeline and resources. I mean, every, there's, that, there's that triangle in, when you're doing project management between scope, time, and resources, and uh, making sure that there still has that, there's still that balance between those three driving components. And then on the bottom, we've got the whole project management piece, which is, you know, basically project management of scope, um, ownership of the project plan and execution, who, the people who do the updates and manage the tasks and project of the project plan, coordinating the resources, uh, making sure we have the uh, resources available for it, um, tracking of the project as we can, as we go along, and then accountability for budget, you know, making sure we understand what's going on from a, from a real time and, and as we go type perspective. One of the key challenges here, a lot of these um, problems you see in this area. First of all, um, getting people to update tasks and time. Um, historically, that's been a challenge. And one of the solutions we like to propose there is, you know, many times you can do workflow-based workflow solutions that would allow um, individuals to update um, elapsed time and um, task task um, completion um, as they go along so that, so that it can actually be notifications that will pop up and say, okay, you have to update this task. Um, resource needs, just making sure we understand the resources are, are allocated and they're, and they're being used appropriately. Um, project tracking, making sure we're consistent with the tracking milestones. And then the whole thing with budget, making sure we're staying on top of this from a budget perspective. And I think the other thing you need to think about is from a pro for portfolio management flow perspective is we need to put reporting and controls around this entire system, ecosystem here so that we can ensure that we can identify um, any type of variance or deviation from planned. Um, and then upward flow. Report status and risks. You know, we provide the transparency at the project management, and then we have flowing back up to the prioritization of initiatives. So we can get that whole circle that goes um, all the way around from the strategic direction all the way to prioritization of, of initiatives, which includes the, out, the ongoing plus um, candidate projects. Any questions on that? Yeah, sorry, Lori. No, no questions were submitted. Okay. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the challenges people ask is, you know, in terms of portfolio management, I mean, one of the, the the challenges here is how do I score candidate projects? And I like to call the term value levers is really how do you quantify and validate um, the value pro provided by an overall portfolio of projects? Um, I mean, one of the, the things that we like to do is when we're when we're establishing or building a, a a PPM solution for a client is really you know try to understand what what kind what are the methods that you denote value? Is it things like speed to market? Is it things like um, is it things like um, emerging technologies? Things like something that you know. Um, positions you within a particular marketplace? Is there, is there a significant re, um, revenue opportunity? So, I mean, some of the challenges when you're defining a project management scoring approach is really these are the critical path here. You're defining a model, identify the metrics. I like to call them value levers, um, update and develop processes um, and, and for the tools that are required to support this, you know, collect and report on the particular candidate projects based on the metrics and then monitor it. To re and that's important, the monitor piece of this is really, you know, let's just figure out what the metrics are. Let's score these things out. Let's use tool to score them and let's report on it and then monitor to ensure that, um, in fact, the value proposition still holds. Um, some of the tools, I mean, and, and I can't overstate that. I mean, there's, there's, I had a client of mine once who told me that there's no such thing as a sunk cost. And I absolutely agree with them. I mean, in, in publicly held companies, that could be more challenging than in privately held ones. But um, the idea of once, just because you've invested in something in the value, it doesn't mean you need to continue doing so. Um, and a lot of times with scarcity of resources and money, I mean, it makes sense in some cases to, to change your direction, um, depending upon how what the real time is or what the current st status is of a particular um, of a particular set of projects. So some of the portfolio analysis questions could be, you know, what are the strategies of the, for technology-driven or organization, for technology-driven innovation, you know, what are some of the options that we have? Um, but let's just start at the bottom here, really. I mean, in terms of the overall spend that comes into a portfolio, you know, really it falls into a couple different buckets here. You've got the keeping, you know, the key business enablers, the keeping the lights on. I mean, a certain number of projects are associated with, um, you know, with base um, based keeping the lights on type activities, um, that could be infrastructure upgrades, that could be, you know, we need to upgrade software because it's going out of, um, an older version is being retired or decommissioned by the particular um, customer. 
Um, then you could have what I call the um, business improvement. It's really focused on, you know, how do we do better with what we have, and which really focuses on enterprise-level solutions. Um, this can be things like operations and efficiency. This could be, you know, it could be cloud technologies. It could be IT operating models. It could be, um, you know, new technologies would, which would achieve integration across lines of business, um, things where we consolidate supply chain projects. If we're doing a supply chain project, you know, th that allow us to achieve economies of scale from a global procurement perspective. Perspective. And then you've got technology-driven innovation, which could be things that would allow us to, you know, expand our business and innovate. And we talked at the beginning of digital disruption. You know, one of the challenges a lot of organizations have, and, and the whole concept of, like, cloud migration, for example, is companies are trying to reduce the amount of time they're spending on keeping the lights on, right? So that's why things like cloud cloud is becoming so much impor so important, because a lot of this is going to software as a service and cloud cloud-based solutions. So... You know, IT as a service is a good example of, you know, basically focusing and standardizing particular technology offerings so that, um, you know, we can focus our energies on things that are focused on innovation um, and disruption. And, and basically we talked about this at the beginning is it's really going to be more of a focus on this type of thing at the front. So the ability to prioritize our portfolio, because really we don't have a lot of decisions to make at the bottom, but we do at the top of this pile here is we really need to make sure that we have a good a good a good handle on you know what drives value for this organization especially when we're dealing with dynamic change so we can score things appropriately and correctly you know here's some examples of project analysis i mean how do we sorry about that um, <clears throat> um project categories you know some types of projects we get uh, strategic projects capital projects regulatory requirements IT enhancement and executive mandates. I mean, some of these, I mean, these are categories that come in, but if you think about it, executive mandate, there shouldn't really be any of those. That should be aligned with strategy. IT enhancements and infrastructure. I mean, a lot of those are things that are driven by the technology, which fall into this bucket here. Um, regulatory, it's another one of these things you really don't have a lot of choice about. Strategic business, that falls in the top. That falls into the, how we handle things like disruption and then approved capital, which support all this. Um, this comes back to like what I call the value levers. I mean, here's some examples of cost savings, revenue at risk, cost avoidance, regulatory risk, um, TCO, ROI. I mean, th these are some that I've seen that some companies have used. Um, I I'm more of a business type person. What's the value proposition? How is it aligned with strategy? How are we enabling the business strategy? And those are the kinds of you know value levers that we should be using um, to evaluate things within the portfolio. Okay, how do we do this? Uh, we talked about PPM, we talked about project management, and really, you know, there's a, there's a construct called the project management office. Uh, many companies have them. Um, some of them are, in my experience, having done this for, you know, 20 years as a strategy consultant with PwC and others, is that, um, you know, many companies don't do this very well. Um, Usually there's a misalignment between the PMO and what, what their ownership and what their fiefdom is. Um, in some cases they are, um, you know, just viewed as a, you know, we do governance, we do standards, but they really have no control over what's actually happening. But, you know, I think it's important to really talk about what the, you know, what, what do they do and what are they supposed to do. Uh, PMO is a vehicle for strategic thinking um, about execution. I mean, they should be focused on, and this is a big one here, it's like, how do we execute? How do we do it better? How do we have continuous improvement? How can we continue to deliver? Um, here's a good one here, establishing a friction, frictionless medium of objective information. That gets back to the whole reports thing I was saying is, I mean, it's really important that there's consistent methods and, and metrics for measuring performance um, and ensuring that we have reports in place for different um, audiences and different groups. I mean, we have, there's a different set of reports for the project manager that would be for the CIO or the COO, um, but making sure we have consistent metrics and measures and provide those in a real-time real um, basis. Uh, business partner to all program constituencies. Okay, this is one where we've got the, like on the bottom we talked about, you know, you've got the providers of, of let's go back up here, hold on. Uh, providers of capabilities and you've got the business side of it as well. Um, understanding risk issues and change control. Um, one of the biggest problems here in many cases is, you know, we don't have transparency in the project. You know, let's understand what the issues are and what change control is and, and have a, you know, an honest vetting. I don't know why this is jumping on me. An honest vetting of what the issues that are outstanding are and making sure that we um, go out and, um, you know, address these things in an honest way so we can make a, a, a real determination of the impacts. Creating efficiencies. That's, again, continuous improvement. Um, putting skin into solving complex problems. 
um, create accountability and a source of generation of project information. Again, this gets back to the whole idea. Uh, what it's not, policing of effort of project constituencies, it's not a checklist and templates, um, it's not for logging problems and issues, it's not passive, it's got to be an active group, and it's got to be aligned <clears throat> with the organization between the business and the providers of a particular capability um, for a PMO to be successful. Um, so, I mean, I think the statement in front of you where leadership can, you know, break the, can break the success of a program. I mean, making sure you've got proper leadership within a PMO and they are aligned with the, with the business leaders and the um, provider leaders, um, I think it's really absolutely critically important for the success of that type of an organization. <clears throat> Oops. Yeah, this is, this is a good... Um, Apologize for that. Something went a little crazy on my slide. Um, I mean, here's a good example of a, of a, a PMO structure. Um, I mean, this is a really good example of the kinds of, you know, roles and responsibilities that should be exa should exist within a project management office. Um, I mean, here's here's this is the classic demand and supply. I mean, what you've got here is flowing from lines of business. You know, demand for a capability, demand for services. For example, I'm asking for you know different pieces of IT develop. If I'm dealing with if I'm dealing with, um, you know, digital transformation, I've got all these different demands that are coming on in terms of, um, you know, capability. Let's do uh, mobility. Let's do um, handheld devices. Let's do analytic projects. I mean, there's just a tremendous demand coming down. And then the supply, which is really what capabilities your organization can bring to delivery against those. <clears throat> and I think this is, you know, in terms of the supply, that's why you're seeing things like software as a service, um, cloud computing, you know, DevOps with continuous build, for example. Um, you know, these are all things that are, are allowing for the speed to increase in terms of ability to deliver successfully based on the speed of demand and the speed of supply increasing. And that's what we talked about, you know, the rapidly changing world that, that, we, that we deal with. Um, I think it's organizationally this whole construct between, you know, the BRM, business relationship manager, and the, and the PMO here is absolutely critical. I mean, understanding what the priorities of the business are, what the strategic drivers of the business are, what the funding is of the business, you know, we evaluate it and score these things um, so that we can get alignment. So that the goal here is to get supply equal to demand, right? So what they're, what they're, they're going to get and what the supply can provide, there's consensus and agreement across these two parties that, you know, this is, this is the best we can do and this is what we can actually deliver so that we're actually working on the right things and the right priorities. Um, and, the, and, and based on the and, – and the reason that's important is really this handshake here, the, the business relationship reflecting, you know, what we can provide, what they – and this is what they're going to ask for, what the costs are. And that's why the PPM, understanding and having consistent metrics and levers to evaluate and score proposals that are coming through here. So you can say, well, you know, there's 10, pro 10 projects that you proposed. Eight of them have the highest strategic value. This is what we can fund. This is the eight of the 10 you're going to get. And then leave the decision to this group about increasing capacity from, you know, hiring additional contractors, vendors, providing additional funding, or dealing with the status quo. But if you're making strategic decisions about, you know, what's being provided instead of, you know, the, the broken model, which you see all too often about demand coming down, you know, supply, since they can't say, well, there's, there isn't this handshake here, they're saying, well, this is all we can provide. And then what ends up happening is you've got a dissatisfied customer here, which is the business, saying, you know, I, you know these, this, this organization can't deliver like they're supposed to deliver. So I think this is a, you know, really valuable construct of how to do this, um, how to organize an organization. One here. <clears throat> um, back to the PMO. I mean, one of the being again a strategy consult for a long time. You know, it's not just the, the technology that goes around it. A, a well constructed PMO. You know, there's other capabilities that need to be included in here. Um, making sure we have a strategy. You know, understanding our value drivers and our proposition from an environment. Get corporate management support. Organization. Making sure we have governance. PMO organization. Excuse me. Um, sourcing and staffing models, change management, um, some of the key processes that come across here, skills and capability, knowledge management, change management, you know, financial management, um, that's pretty important. Change management is a big part of this. I mean, one of the things organizations try to transform, they try to implement ch change, they try to embark on digital transformation, they don't understand what the organizational impacts are. Um, and making sure that they can actually deal with those particular pieces of it. Um, human resources is important too, making sure we've got the skills and people who can um, carry out this, the requirements of a changed organization. Um, 
capabilities is really the core PMO capabilities, you know, providing these particular pieces. And, you know, us, you know, being a Microsoft shop, I mean, Project Online and Power BI are absolutely fantastic tools for providing this technology foundation and, and providing the technology core that, a, that an organization requires. So, you know, the ability to support demand that comes in and portfolio and, and score portfolio in, in a um, numeric way, in such a way that there's, there's, there's analytic data supporting portfolio rationalization decisions and portfolio management decisions against not just what's currently in flight, but what could be in flight. You know, project management, where we've got different standards and different um, schedules in place. We talked about consistency and approaches. You know, there might be like six different types of projects we do, but there's six different templates that we use and there's reports around it. Um, resource management, enterprise resource management, not just siloed resource management. Um, I mean, that's one of the, the challenges I see with organizations in many cases have grown through acquisition where you've got, dis, you've got these silos organizationally and, and getting to this enterprise view is pretty hard from a change management perspective, but from a value proposition and ability to deliver cons, um, quickly and effectively, um, it's a primary driver in terms of the overall um, value of, the, of what can actually be delivered at a particular place. Collaboration in project sites, um, that's one where we want to make sure that we are reusing um, documentation, things that have been learned in the past, data that's been used in the past, um, and reusing that so that we actually learn from our mistakes and improve our overall process as we flow. Reporting, um, that's, that's a pretty important thing around, you know, beginning, making sure you have consistent projects and benchmarks around this. And then some of the technology, tech, PPM technology, knowledge infrastructure and solutions. So, I mean, this, this capability model is one I use quite a bit, and, and a lot of people, when they see this, they say, well, you know, we don't do all that. It's like, well, you know what, it takes time to get there, and, and adapt, adoption is pretty, um, takes a little bit of time, but you know, here's a couple examples here that, you know, the, they, the way they measure these things in many, you know, where they are in terms of being able to do all those things, it's around, you know, what they call maturity, PPM maturity. Um, here, there's some really good models out there, the Gartner Group um, distributes um, that talk about these things, the IT score for BPM maturity, you know, we talk about, um, you know, these are some of the capabilities. We talk about governance, metrics, technology, methodologies, competencies, and organization, and they talk about how it takes time um, as you move down this maturity model to, to gain all those different dimensions and move along those different dimensions. Um, here's some other one examples here where, you know, where are we from a people? Are we reactive? Are we having a discipline? Are we initial integration, effective integration? Then we have innovation where we can focus on, you know, really being a forward-leaning um, organization. Usually when I, when I deal with a client, um, usually they're here, two, uh, maybe one or two. Uh, but companies can get there, you know, relatively quickly. But the value prop is just fantastic because if you think about it, if you're pushing all of your strategic investment through this portfolio pipeline, and you know, we talked about at the beginning of this, the importance of transformation. You know, getting this right is critically important to the organization. If it's slow, if you don't know what you're working on, if you're delivering, you're delivering improperly, you know, the Amazons of the world are, and, you know, they're, they're going to come up out there and, and just, um, you know, really just really establish a, a stronger marketplace. I mean, one of the things people talk about is that innovation, there's really, you know, a lot of, there's a couple of real leaders in the innovation front. They talk about Amazon, they talk about Apple, you know, you talk about some of those, but, you know, other companies need to be focused on innovation as well. Um, and, and the ability to quickly and effectively and accurately deliver projects is, um, is absolutely critical to the success of the project, to the, to the program. Takes time to get there. What should we focus on if we were building a program management office or a PMO? Um, strategic areas, pain point, and risk areas. You know, really focus on, you know, where do we think the value prop is? I mean, when I'm, when I'm building these things, building a PPM or building a PMO, um, usually the way we start this is, you know, well, they think the portfolio is too big, the problem's too difficult to overcome. But what you can do in many cases is say, okay, you know, what are your top 10 strategic priorities that you've got? What are the top 10 projects that have to happen? And focus on that. Okay, don't focus on on every trying to, you know, you know, boil the ocean at one time. Focus on the areas where there's a big value proposition that are really critical to the enterprise. Focus on innovation. Focus on pain points that are really causing you difficulties. Um, in terms of best practices, you know, you should focus on best practices. Um, try to redesign the operating model to get to the beginning of this. And then, you know, focusing on training and adoption. I mean, one of the challenges that organizations have is that they, you know, getting the staff and, and getting the project managers, the program managers, the portfolio managers, and everybody on the same page, you know, training people, making sure people understand their role in the organization, giving people the opportunity to move to different areas in an organization. I might be a portfolio manager initially, but now I can be, you know, work in the, in the 
the, the project management office now or, or have the opportunity to work on um, scoping and, and business cases. I mean, give people an opportunity to develop different skills. You know, and as you do, as you move towards um, this optimization area within the Gartner model, um, as you, you know, go from crawl, walk to run. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to do a demo here. Um, really, you know, I talked about, you know, using the Microsoft Project Suite to support um, the capabilities of this. And I think this is, you know, this is the model I like to go for. I mean, you like to reflect from, um, you know, I like to basically reflect from this is the capabilities that we need to support and how we use Project Online to and, and Power BI. I think that's absolutely critical um, to provide these overall capabilities. Um, any questions, Lori, at this point? Are we still... Uh, um, nothing about the content, more about getting copies of the slides, John. Okay. <clears throat> so we can address that later. Okay. okay. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, so let's, um, let's talk about um, Project Online. Um, it's a cloud-based application. Um, that's fantastic. You don't want you want something on the cloud, and some of the advantages of that are, you know, ease of adoption, um, a subscription-based model. So as you bring users on, you can assign licenses and buy licenses. Um, we use this a lot for global clients where latency is a concern. So the ability to push content and push project online across different geographies is pretty important. Um, it's secure. Microsoft spends a ton of money on on security more than any other enterprise can do. I mean, one of the things you hear all the time is, well, cloud's not secure. And my argument would be is, have you ever heard of a breach at a cloud provider? <laughs> um, it happens, it usually happens on on-prem because because of the cost impacts of maintaining security. Um, DR, um, they do a great job. Microsoft does a great job with disaster recovery. Um, I mean, going with cloud is really the way to go. And, and one of the things we do from a quantum perspective is, you know, in terms of migrating people from on-prem to cloud, we, we, we do that frequently. Um, a lot of times we bring them from on-prem to cloud, um, and then we can talk about some of the optimization based on the strategy stuff we talked about earlier. But let's talk about this is within Project Online. This is what's called Project Center. It's the highest level within Project Online. You can see, you know, these are the primary areas. Um, in terms of how things align with the organizational model that we have, I mean, we've got, you know, projects, resources. Um, we've got the, and some of the other issues. We've got issues and risks. And then we've got strategy, which is around, um, you know, prioritization and priorities that go along with that. And this is why I was saying this is a multi-episode series, because we're going to dive into different parts of this as we go, um, focus on different components of it. But for purposes of our um, project, let's talk about, you know, what do we have in a particular project? Clicking on the projects area here, go into um, the enterprise. I mean, the thing that this thing does really well is you've got, this is what we call based on the views, hold on here, doo, doo, doo. I'm looking, there's the, the, one of the key concepts within Project Center here is really this whole idea of views where you can get different views of the different, uh, the project portfolio. Uh, I'm looking at it from a portfolio perspective, so I'm, I'm filtering it by types of projects. So I've got enterprise type projects, um, finance type projects, and all this is configurable and what the fields are across the top here, this is all configurable. Um, these little traffic lights, this is frequently, um, a lot of times it's like, where are we in terms of ROI? Um, where are we in terms of cost? Um, and having real-time updates that go with that. Um, timeline on the top is you know, something you can construct that shows um, dependencies across the different projects of it. But the thing that's cool here is if you're, if you're looking at it, you know, we talked about at the beginning of this, you know, making sure that we have consistent types of projects that flow through the portfolio. Project Online really has what, these are what we call project types and project schedules. Um, and that corresponds really nicely here to, you know, consistency in terms of approach that flows across the overall project. So, you know, we might have one that could be focused on, you know, rapid project. We could have one on slow project. We could have M&A projects. Um, I mean, that's one of the great things about the solution is it's entirely scalable. I mean, I built this for M&A. I've done it for new product development, marketing. Um, let's see what else we've done it for. Um, building, construction, engineering applications. I mean, you, if, you could, if, it has, if it has a flow, you can build a project for it. Um, so, and you can actually have multiple types. A lot of times when you're implementing, it might start with IT, but then after you get IT up and running, the M&A guys want to do something, the marketing guys want to do something. Um, so these, you know, this consistency in terms of overall approaches are here. So you can come through and say, okay, let me create a project of a certain type. It'll have different gating, um, different milestones. Um, and I created one already this morning called QPM Webinar Project. So if I go into QPM Webinar Project, um, each one of these projects will have, 
you know, a couple different attributes. On the left here, you think these are things called project detail pages, all configurable. So if I set up my project, I can have project details. Oops. Yeah, let's leave that. You know, I can put specific pieces of data that I want associated with a particular project that go with it, um, departments, country, state, health, ratings. Um, a lot of times what, you do, what we do here is we put governance in, um, and this is really the beginning of the, beginning of the flow here. And um, one of the ones, and, and so this is all stuff that, you know, I put governance in here, cost information in here, um, business case information in here. There's all kinds of stuff you can put in. Um, and then the other thing you can do is, is this whole thing called strategic impact, um, which really focuses on scoring of individual projects. Um, I mean, remember at the beginning of this story, we talked about the importance of making sure you have a consistent, empirical way of scoring projects as they enter the portfolio. So, for example, when I bring things in here, that I have a candidate project that the line of business wants to propose, and I'm the PMO guy, and I've only got so many, so many dollars and so many people, you know, I need to be able to understand whether I should work on a project or not score on a, or not work on a project. And what Project Online does a really good job of here is it has this, what I call, um, you know, value levers. It's really what are the drivers of value for your organization um, that, that you can use to score these things. Um, so when it actually comes time to look at the portfolio, you can look at all the different projects based on these particular um, components that you might have. Um, and we'll look at that quickly as well, because we're going to have other sessions that focus on those specific things. Um, so, I mean, this is, and the other thing that's kind of neat is these, is these strategic impacts is that there could be different sets of these. So if I've got one for M&A, that might have a different set of criteria. I can do them for IT. I can do them for um, R&D or, or new product development. They can have all different scores um, depending upon who the target audience might be. Um, and also for each one of the projects, you can have a project site, um, which really, I mean, Project Online sits on top of SharePoint. So it's pretty important to understand that, you know, the ability to store documents and be a, a consistent repository um, for specific projects is, is pretty important. Um, and where this is really useful is if you're doing things like, um, you know, for example, production support around IT, you can have a, a parent project and have children projects for subsequent enhancements and have a system of record or keep all the primary system documents within a project site. Um, M&A, you can put your due diligence questionnaires and include them within the project sites and you can write and organize security in such a way that you can um, build it in there. Um, BPO, if you're doing business process optimization, you can put the business process flows in here. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do from, a, from an organizational perspective here to, to, to store, to basically align documentation and forms with a particular project. Um, so this is the, you know, the primary project detail pages, and if you look at the schedule, you know, this is the project, for, this is what I called it, I created this as an enterprise project, it was the type I used, um, it has a consistent set of um, milestones and activities, or actually session recovery, there we go, I have to save some stuff here, but it has consistent, it has a consistent set of um, milestones um, that flow their way across here, um, we, we're going to look at all this in the subsequent sessions. Um, so this is what, you know, what you get from a project perspective is, you know, this really manages the whole, from a flow perspective, the intake in terms of the scoring, the consistent schedule that will go across here from a project management perspective so we can figure out and empirically score these things. And we'll, we'll look at this quick over here. If we go to, oops. If I look at, like, for example, when I want to look at the overall portfolio of projects, you know, I, I can evaluate and, and create a different set of levers and different set of drivers that are associated with the particular project, which scores things on the intake side. You know, these are the value drivers that we identified. All these are, are scorable and, and can be uh, modified as we go. Um, you can go ahead and do prioritization of them so that, you know, we can say, okay, I've got six value levers, but they're not all equal, right? They might have some that I'm going to say, you know, for example, I might have one that's more equal than others. I might say this one's worth, from a weighting perspective, is worth 40% um, versus um, one that's worth 20%. I mean, here's a good example of ones where we have different sets of prioritizations for different audiences. I've got HR projects. I've got um, COO projects. Um, they all flow together. And then when you get to portfolio analysis, you can do all the what-if analysis that's associated with it. Um, so if I've got a project here where I'm going to look at my 2015 to 2018 portfolio, I can click on this, 
and do a whole bunch of, you know, do a series of what-if analysis that says, you know, based upon, you know, resource constraints and dollar constraints, you know, which one of these should be included in the portfolio, and then do what-if analysis that says, okay, if I come up with more dollars, well, what is the impact with doing that? Um, and in this particular model, this is the portfolio analysis. We're using executive consensus for for drivers, you know, that I can look at, you know, analyze cost. You know, basically based on the portfolio of projects that I have, you know, this tells me if I spend seven million dollars, if I what this tells me are the portfolio projects that I have. Let's go to here in a baseline here. <clears throat> you know, you could do a what if analysis that says, you know, if I fund everything, if I get 100% of my strategic value, you know, here's how this would um, align. It would cost me 8.99 million dollars to get 100% of my strategic value. Remember, we scored every one of these projects, so some are more valuable than others. Um, you know, we can do what if analysis that say, you know, let's do seven million here. So if we drop it down to seven million, um, it says, well, based on the va overall value of these projects, you know, these are the ones that I shouldn't do because they're of lower value than some of these other ones. So I mean, again, this, the thing that this helps you do is this optimizes your portfolio, what you should do, what you should take in. It makes that it gives you data points and empirical data to support specific project decisions that go with it. Um, so I mean, we're going to talk about all this in much more detail. And then for um, last component of it here is the whole resource analysis component of it. Um, I mean, I like to have the portfolio manager and the resource manager kind of joined at the hip. Um, so what you can do here is if your resource manager is, you know, if you want to select on specific people, understand what they're working on, um, you know, you can do analysis against that. You can do it by department. Uh, a lot of times you can add a column here that allows you to look at it from a department perspective. Um, so if I go here and look at my resource portfolio, you know, I can look at, like, for example, capacity planning. Based on what these individuals who I've selected are working on, you know, how much capacity do I have left? And the way I've set it up right now is I've got a bunch of people standing around with, uh, you know, zero capacity, but then there's a jump here, you know, in terms of people getting availability, it increases to 40 here, here it goes to, so there's different pieces here, and you can look at it from people and, you know, individuals as well. So there's a lot of work you can do here from a capacity perspective. Um, and we're going to talk about all this in the subsequent sessions that come along. And then for the... Um, the last part of this, and this is the this is the absolute sweetener, is Power BI. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important this tool is, uh, because you know if you look at Gartner Group's scoring of of um, BI solutions, this is upper right quadrant. Um, you can do you can do reports here that really, you know, give you this enterprise view. It's real time, so every morning you wake up, here's your report, and it'll give you some idea where your portfolio and how it's doing, you know, what's completed and what's closed. Um, I mean, here's some examples of uh, there we go, project overview dashboard where I can look at it, basically depending upon the audience, I can say, okay, these are the projects that I have, here's the stages, start, end date, you know, where are we from a cost perspective, what issues and risks do I have? If I want to deep dive on one of these, I can, you know, have the option of doing that as well. Um, where's the one I did this morning? Is that in there? You know, if I want to click on a specific project to just focus on one project, I have the option of doing that. Um, this is this is incredibly valuable piece of technology, um, and the thing that's cool about Power BI is that you know you can make these things that are you know very very visual in nature. Um, so depending upon who your audience is, if they're less quantitative and more visual, you can do that, um, and they're they're real time as well. So you know with one single source of <clears throat> truth, um, it really gives you the opportunity to pull data from a lot of the places and um, you know coming up with specific and valuable information that goes with it. So I mean, Power BI is pretty important, and I think one of the, the tools, again, that we, you know, and that's from a demo perspective, we're going to talk about all this stuff in, in a lot more detail as we go into the other episodes of this. I know we're running out of time here. Um, again, one of the tools that we sell from Quantum PM is this whole BI Advantage thing, which is a tool ba is an Azure-based integration tool um, that uses basically rules to allow you to integrate lots of different data and pull data into Power BI reports and do analytics, um, do trend analysis. Um, we, you know, we feel this is really, you know, pretty um, innovative piece of technology, and a lot of others in the marketplace don't have that. Um, so if you, if you think about it, if you're pulling data from, you know, what you talked about, if you want to pull from Project Online, if you want to pull data from Salesforce, SAP, ADP, you know, and pull them all into a consistent presentation and consistent set of enterprise reporting, um, this is a really powerful tool. And, and when we talked about the digital economy and integration, I mean, you can bring, you know, IoT into this. Um, this is really the whole ability to bring and link things up together. John, we have a couple of questions. Okay. Yes, I, um, yes, sure. 
Okay, so first one is where does PI come into picture while doing these various analysis? Where and how? Where does what? Where and how? Does BI, Power BI come into the picture? Okay, yeah, Power BI, basically, the way, the way Power BI comes into the picture is that, let me bring Power BI up here, is when you set up the reports, you link it up to the PWA that you have in Project Online. So the reports and dashboards that we have, essentially what it does, it pulls data from Project Online in, in this particular example. Um, the thing you can do with um, Power BI is, you know, so, so basically, you can get a real-time report against your portfolio of projects anytime you want. And I've just got some examples here of, of ones you, that are pulled out that, that, that I just pulled for this for this presentation. But it's integrated completely. It's part, all part of Office 365, um, so it's all fully integrated. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool about Power BI is that they've they've got these Apple Source feeds here, so you can also use Power BI with other technology providers. I mean, we've got ones here that there's, these are standard Power BI reports and content packs is what they call them um, that are provided by other vendors. For example, if you're using Jira for agile development, there's a set there. Here's a set for Project Online that come. Microsoft provides these standard reports. Um, you know, I've, I've, we've got some for ServiceNow, if you're doing incidents for ServiceNow. I mean, you can see all the different content packs there. These are just available publicly uh, when you get Project Online, uh, when you get Power BI. Um, and the thing is, if anybody wants to try play around with, with Power BI, the desktop version is free. So just go on the Microsoft website and you can download it. So. Okay, another, another question is about BI Advantage. Is it built on or built using Power BI? Um, it is built, it's built using it. It's built in Azure is the way it works. And it's, um, we can actually have a separate conversation on that one, but really it's built on using Azure with with Power BI. Um, it's got an integration office, um, brings all the different pieces together, but it uses um, Azure and it's a rule-based piece that fits on top of that. I mean, we sell it as a subscription-based, but I, mean, we, we, I know from a Quantum PM perspective, you know, we've got clients that have got 10,000 users using um, BI Advantage. Uh, we have a bank that we have that we've got multiple clients that do this type of thing, and this is, you know, the integration question. If we were going to integrate, for example, with like ServiceNow or Jira or SAP or any of these other ones, and get this enterprise level data, you know, this would be the way to do it because it's really entirely rules based and it's based on Azure. Um, so it's not like we have to do like point to point or anything of that sort. Okay. Um, one last question: Are these Power BI reports available for others, or do I have to write my own? Okay, uh, usually you can write your own or you can get them the other ones. In terms of Power BI reports, if you get Power BI, um, let me, if you go under this get data piece, these are content packs that are available in public. Um, so anything that's out there that's associated with a, um, with a vendor piece of software you might have, all that stuff is out there that's free. Uh, Microsoft has project online reports. Those are free that come out there. Um, so there's the, those are all ones that you can get um, just based off of um, public applications that are out there provided by Microsoft. Other ones you can develop yourself. I mean, that's one of the cool things about Power BI is it's not hard to develop. Um, it's real simple um, and it's flexible. And the thing we, when I, I'll try to, when we get to the report session, we'll do that. Um, there's this concept within Power BI called dashboards versus reports. Um, a dashboard really is a, it's when you pull elements of a bunch of different reports and put them in a dashboard. And it's really cool because, you know, it allows you to, um, you know, develop a dashboard for a specific audience. For example, if I want a CIO dashboard, instead of having a separate report just for the CIO, you have this dashboard which pulls data from um, reports that you're using real time. Um, and then if somebody wants to drill into it, you can just click on the specific field within the dashboard and take you right down into the report. Uh, okay, no other questions, John. All right, well, everybody, thank you very much for uh, attending today. Um, I think, you know, if you need to get in touch with this, um, you know, that's, that's I'm John, John Single at quantumpm.com. Uh, that's my number there. Um, otherwise, you can uh, reach out to us. You know, that's our Quantum PM, and this is our, if you wanted to sign up for additional sessions, just uh, fill Quantum PM at webinars. And next one we're going to talk about is Agile and the waterfall approaches. We'll talk about, you know, continuous delivery, and we'll talk about um, waterfall approaches as we go, um, both theoretically. I mean, that's one of the things I try to do at these sessions is be, you know, let's set the stage.